the Deseret Book Audio Library presents John By The Way and a talk entitled Get an Attitude Heroic Examples from the Book of Mormon This talk was recorded in front of a live audience And now John By The Way This is really fun to be here, and uh, as you heard my introduction, my first name is John, which is very clever. My parents thought for weeks and came up with that one, and <laughs> my last name is By the Way, and that's really it. And for those of you who are good in English, yes, that's a prepositional phrase. And that means if my kids, if their first name is a verb, they'll be a sentence. <laughs> See, but that would be rude. I won't do that to my children, but... A couple of years ago, something really funny happened. I went to, uh, I got a date, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's not the really funny thing. But I went to the Olive Garden, and the hostess came out, and they're having a busy night. They're always busy, it seems like. And she's like, hi, welcome to Olive Garden. Um, we have a 10-minute wait. Can I take your name, please? And see, when people are happy, they tilt their heads. I said, can I take your name, please? And I thought, oh, here we go. You know, and I said, yeah, it's, it's by the way. And she went just like this. By the way, what? And I said, no, that's my name. And she said, uh-uh. I said, yeah, that's my name. She said, oh, I bet you get teased about that. And I wanted to act like, you know, it had never occurred to me that my name was strange and go, why would I get teased about that? Let's see. By the way, by, by, by the way, by the way. By the, yeah, hey. But that would have been rude, so I just said, yeah, I got teased about it a lot. She says, where does that name come from? And I tried to give a straight face. I said, it's Japanese. So, but it isn't really. I spend most of my time where I work on the phone, and whenever I try and leave a message, you know, it's like, yeah, would you tell them that John, by the way, call, please? By the way? No, by the way is my last name. <laughs> sure. B-Y-T-H-E-W-A-Y. -E yeah, yeah, just like it sounds. Isn't that something? Yeah. No, no spaces or hyphens. Uh, no, I'm not an Indian. Um, my ancestors came from England. They lived kind of next to the road, so they called them the, the by the way people. <laughs> Probably drunks. I don't know what they were doing there. So. Oh, by the way, John, what's your last name? Now, that's a good one. <laughs> you got me there, darn you. And what's your name? Brother Showerhammer. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. The time I went to the airport, I gave the Delta Airlines man my ticket. He looked at it and he says, Mr. By the way. Are you going to name your son Owen? <laughs> yeah, then his name would be Owen, by the way. <laughs> Probably not. You know. Actually, I started to laugh. I thought I'd heard him all about the time first grade was over, and I thought about that one and kind of went, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Owen, by, yeah. That's it. No, I'm, you know, but that was fun. Well, let's get down to work here. I'm really happy to be with you. I'm happy for that beautiful musical number and the opening prayer and the spirit that's here already. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about one of my favorite things in the whole world. And as you can see right now, I am now hugging my scriptures. You know, we single people have to hug something. But I am hugging my scriptures. And I want to talk tonight mostly about the Book of Mormon and how wonderful it is. Now, here's the fun thing about the Book of Mormon that you, can, you can't do this with your biology book. You can't do this with your math book. You can't do There's only a few books in the whole world you can do this with. And the Book of Mormon, and President Benson said this. He said, whenever you're reading, I'm paraphrasing, whenever you read the Book of Mormon, you can ask yourself, why did Mormon decide to put this in here? Why did Alma decide to write this? Why did Moroni think this was uh, good enough to leave in here? And that's really fun. And you can always ask yourself that. Why? Well, one of the things Moroni said, Moroni 931, he says, you know, don't condemn us because of our imperfections. We've written these things so that you may learn to be wiser than we have been. Uh, also, Moroni in Mormon 8.35, this is a scary one, I love this one, he said this. I mean, sometimes when we read scriptures, we get that scripture voice. Don't do the scripture voice, okay? The scripture voice is... Do you see Moroni talking like that? I don't think so, okay? So here's Moroni speaking in Mormon 8.35, he said this. Behold... I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know what you're doing. <laughs> Actually, what it says is, and I know you're doing. And that is, that is exciting, because when we read, we can think, you mean he saw our day, he saw our problems? Yes, he did. And they wrote to us, this is to us. And so we can read it that way. Now, how does it start out? Very interesting. All of a sudden, we're confronted with attitudes. I wonder if they saw the late 20th century and thought, hmm, 
Some pretty strange attitudes going around. We'll start out with this family, Lehi, Sariah, Nephi, Laman, Lemuel, Sam. And they leave. Lehi tells them they have to leave. They go, scholars tell us, 200 miles. And Lehi says, now can you imagine if this were to happen today? They didn't drive. They walked 200 miles. And then Lehi says, um, sons, we need to go back and get the plates. Now, I'm sorry to say this, but my generation, us, you and me, our generation, we probably would have said, Dad, could we have thought of this a little earlier? Hello, 200 miles, I'm so sure. Or we may have said this, oh, I wish we wouldn't, but our generation, this is what we do. We would have said this, well, is it going to be fun? Some of you said that before coming to this fireside. Mom, is it going to be fun? I'm sure some boring speaker all night. And there they are. Laman and Lemuel, and this is what they really said, 1 Nephi 3.5. I hope you brought your scriptures tonight. 1 Nephi 3.5, what did they really say? They said this. Lehi was telling Nephi what happened. He said, your brothers say, 1 Nephi 3.5, your brothers say it is a hard thing I have required. And he said, but I didn't require it of them. It's a commandment of the Lord. Okay, here's <laughs> Laman and Lemuel. Sounds like it's going to be hard. <laughs> it's going to be hard. Which makes Nephi's response even more amazing, realizing this is 200 miles that they just walked. Nephi, and you think I'm saying this because I'm supposed to say it. I'm sorry. I have such deep love and respect for Nephi. Listen to him. He was absolutely unstoppable. Nephi says what? I'll go. I'll do it. You're a prophet, Lehi. You're my father, but you're a prophet. I'll do anything you want. I will go. I'll do. Laman and Lemuel. This is going to be hard. Now, let's not be too hard on Laman and Lemuel, okay? Because sometimes, myself included, we're a little bit more like Laman and Lemuel than we want to admit, huh? Because did they go back? Uh -huh. Did they help Nephi build the ship? Yeah, they just complained first. We complain, and then we go to seminary. We complain, and then we read our scriptures. We complain, and then we join the family for home evening. Maybe we're a little bit more like Laman and Lemuel than we want to believe, because they went. Eventually. Now, the funny part is this, okay? Because <laughs> they go, they get the plates. You, you know what happened. Three different attempts. Nephi's so amazing. He comes back with the plates. And then Lehi says, um, sons, notice the different attitude. Um, y'all need to go back and get a wife. And this time they say, okay. <laughs> and they're out of there and they come back. Okay, that's just a little side note. Okay, but anyway. One time I was at a standards night, which we have in the church sometimes, and there was a Kleenex box, except it was the more rectangular variety with the needlepoint thinger over the top, which is a sign of the true church or something. <laughs> that needlepoint thing, you know. They took the needlepoint thing off the top, passed it around, and everybody submitted questions, and it was a chastity-type lesson. And the bishop picked, we're talking about attitudes now. I'm going to call this part the three attitudes. Okay, you've heard of the Beatitudes? These are the three attitudes, okay? They picked one out. This is what it said. Absolutely amazed me. Talk about attitudes that Moroni and Mormons saw us with, you know. This is what it said. How far can we go before we have to see the bishop? Okay, yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. Oh, nice attitude. Now, I'm going to reword that in the worst possible way I can think of it, and it would be this. How bad can I be? Can you see how awful that sounds? How bad can I be? If there's a line separating what's good and what's bad, they want to know exactly where the line is so that they can live life right next to it. Okay? And you see this attitude coming out in lots of different areas. For example, dress code. Where exactly is my knee, mother? <laughs> like exactly where does it start? You know? Where exactly is long hair, dad? Okay, well, mom, it's not that bad of a movie. It's not R. Okay, can you see the attitude? It's what can we get away with? It's okay to be this bad. Don't you see? Why do you go to seminary? They might answer, because I have to. I'm forced. Hello. <laughs> if you were to ask them about this, they might say, well, I'm not perfect. But listen, they're not trying to be perfect. They're not even trying to be good. They want to know, how bad can I be? See how frightening that is? Okay, the next one sounds a little bit better, but it's equally scary to me, and it's this one. Teenagers sometimes shorten the word supposed into the word post. Have you ever noticed that? Well, how good are we supposed to be? <laughs> You know, why do you go to seminary? Because we're supposed to. <laughs> why do you go to church? Because we're supposed to. I'm, I'm the postman. Do what I'm supposed to. Okay? And it's nice to do what you're supposed to, but the problem is sometimes there's an upper limit. One time, I mean, imagine this assignment. This scared me to death. Yes, brother, by the way, would you come and talk to our 
young women's group, and there's a slight problem because there's kind of an unofficial club, and they get together every Wednesday night, and they watch Melrose Place on 90210. Would you come and talk them out of it, please? Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Am I going to do that? So I did my best. So we went there, and we finally we got out the 13th article of faith, which says, now don't use her scripture voice at the end if there's anything that is virtuous, lovely, of good report, and praiseworthy. Okay, stop. Don't use your scripture voice. We, us, yeah, we seek after these things. Okay, see how, how differently it is that way? If there's anything that is lovely and virtuous and good report and praiseworthy, we, we seek after these things. Unless our favorite show is on. <laughs> we seek after these things and we fast forward the bad parts. <laughs> you see? And it was really fun to talk about this because some of the teenagers <laughs> on their face, you could see that, that, that look like they were learning something brand new, like, you mean like over here's the Articles of Faith and over here's the way we live and you mean we're, we're supposed to connect them? <laughs> and of course, I did my charades on the nose thing. Yeah, that's what it means. We're supposed to connect them. <laughs> mean when I pick up my remote, I'm supposed to remember the Articles of Faith? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's the gospel. Oh, so we had a long talk about television and everything, and that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. But I finally asked them, would you be willing to give up your worst TV show to know God? What would you give up to know God a little bit better? Would you give up your worst TV shows, or, or is that too much to ask? You know, do you have favorite sins? I'm not ready to give that one up yet, you know. <laughs> kind of want to enjoy that one for a while longer. Would you give up your worst TV shows to know God? And so we had this nice discussion, and then finally I thought, well, I've talked about this enough. Um, everybody who'd be willing to give up their worst TV shows to know God, please stand up. And about three quarters of them stood up. And there was about a fourth that had this, <laughs> the best way I can explain this attitude is this look on their face, okay? It's not attractive, but I'll do my best. And it, it's this. <laughs> and what it seemed to be saying to me was this. Okay, this, this is the best way to describe the how good are we post to be attitude. And also, it will reveal to you why it's a problem. Because this was the, the face. Well, I want to be good, but I don't want to be that good. Okay, can you hear the problem there? Listen to Carlos Acey comes to Priesthood Conference, Elder Acey, in, uh, I think it was April of 92. And he stood in front of the young men and he said this. There is a lie, a vicious lie, circulating in the church and taking its toll among the young. And that is that a well-balanced man must guard against becoming too righteous. See, oh, it's so scary. Well, I want to be good, but I don't want to be that good. How good are we supposed to be? So do you see what I'm talking about? Okay, now there's another one. I was in Arkansas, in Arkadelphia. I can't even remember what the name of the college was. A small college, it was many years ago. Arkadelphia, Arkansas. I'm supposed to teach class, I'm brand new. I'm in this classroom and all these guys start running. And they come running up in front, are you the teacher? Yeah, cool. They're getting out their scriptures and they're sitting down and I thought, well, I've got five minutes. I'll go talk to these guys. What's your name? This kid stands up. It's Aaron. How old are you, Aaron? 16. I said, Aaron, how many uh, members of the church in your high school? Um, five. Wow. How many students total? It's about 1,500. Is that hard? Yes. They're always watching us and, and uh, some of them yell at us <laughs> and stuff. But this is great. I've never seen so many Mormons in my life, and there's going to be a dance. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He gets all excited, you know. <laughs> Next guy, what's your name? Aaron. How old are you, Aaron? I'm 15. How many Mormons in your high school? Three. Are they all here at the youth conference? Yeah, the other two are my sisters. <laughs> How would you feel? Your family versus the high school, you know? You're the, the members of the church. It's okay. It's an uneven match favoring the three. So great. These kids were so cool. I just love these guys because they were so sharp. So there's three of you, huh? Yeah, and your sister's, yeah, is that hard? Yeah, it's really tough. Sometimes they call us a cult and yell at us and stuff, but this is so fun. I didn't know there were this many Mormons in church, you know? <laughs> it's just they hadn't seen this many. Oh, they were so excited. And then it was this. Okay, this is what cut me to the quick because I grew up in Utah. I said, um, why do you go to seminary? You know, because I found out they, had, they go at five in the morning. And some of them drive to get there by five, okay? Why do you go to seminary so early? And this was their answer, okay? Cut me to the quick. See what it does to you inside. It wasn't, because I have to. It wasn't, because we're supposed to, either. <laughs> so why do you get up so early and go to seminary? And this was the answer. It was kind of a, 
they gave me that what a stupid question look, you know, like, and this kid says, because I want to. Man, I love it. This is the best part of my day. Jesus was so amazing, huh? I want to think like that. I want to be like him. And after a few minutes talking to these valiant young men, I was like, I'll just sit here. Why don't you teach the class today, you know? They weren't asking, how bad can I be? And they weren't asking, well, how good are we supposed to be? Theirs was a statement. It was like this. I want to be valiant. Is it high class? Is it above average? Is it better than normal, brother, by the way? Give that to me. I want to be valiant. I love it. I want, I just, I want to see how good I can be. Totally different question, huh? And I was blown away. I just love these young men. And they're all over the place. They're here tonight. Man. So that's the three attitudes. And throughout the Book of Mormon, you'll notice that these wonderful people that we meet, these characters, these prophets, have that I want to be valiant attitude. There's Nephi. You need to go back 200 miles. And Nephi's, I would walk 200 miles and I would walk 200 more. And he's just, I'll go. I'll do it. Anything you say, Lehi. Now, you may think, but sometimes it's hard to read scriptures. You know, if you use your imagination just a little bit, you can bring the scriptures right to life. Bring them right off the pages. But let me give you an example. Can you tell me your name? Leaning down like this. What's your name? Cammie. And who's that next to you with the dark hair? What's your name? Cammie and Melissa. Are you guys friends? Look, they didn't have to check. Oh, they did later. I saw that. Sometimes when you ask girls if they're friends, they have to check. You know, are you friends? <laughs> Those are my earrings, I'm so sure, you know. But Cammie and Melissa didn't have to, oh, especially if they're sisters, then they're just, you know, like this. But no, they're great. Cammie and Melissa are friends. Let's say, just for fun, let's imagine us, like, in the place of Cammie and Melissa. Let's say that Cammie and Melissa are walking around in heaven, okay? And they're walking around, and all of a sudden, Melissa goes, Cammie. And Cammie goes, what? And Melissa goes, do you know who that is? And Cammie goes, no. And Melissa goes, that's Nephi. And Cammie goes, uh-uh. <laughs> and Melissa says, that is Nephi. Go say hi to him. And Cammie goes, no. <laughs> and then being a teenager, she says, come with me. <laughs> Melissa goes, okay. So they go walking over. And I'm taking some some fictional license here, but they go walking over, and my friends, it's Nephi. And Nephi's sitting there on a rock, talking to some people, you know? And then I built a ship, and we all got on. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I know, I'm joking. I know that's what, not what Nephi will be saying, because of what he said so much when he, was, he wrote to us. But there's Nephi. And I know that many of you here love and honor and respect Nephi as I do. I'm just using some fictional license here, but it's Nephi. And you're going to meet him, and I'll tell you how I know that in a minute. But so here comes Cammie and Melissa, and Cammie's, you know, a little timid, going to tap him on the shoulder from behind, you know. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, what do you call him? Brother Nephi? I don't know what you call him. Excuse me, Nephi? And Nephi stands up and turns around, and Cammie goes. <laughs> and Nephi turns around and extends his hand. Can you imagine what this is going to be like? And he says, Hi. Don't you think he'll be nice? Or maybe in Reformed Egyptian, he says, I don't know what to say. He says, hi. And Cammie says, wow, you are large in stature. <laughs> I build a ship. You are a ship. You're huge. That'd be fun. Okay, I'm sorry. But think about it. You're going to meet him. What are you going to say? Would you like to know what I'm going to say? Now, we learn the, the scriptures on different levels. When we're young, we know the names of the characters and the stories. And then we start to learn some of the principles. And then we find deep meanings and symbolic meanings. And I'm not sure where I am. But right now, this is what I would say to Nephi. I, I hope I still have 30, 40 more years on this earth to really study the Book of Mormon. But what am I going to say when I meet Nephi, if I were to meet him tonight? At first, I would just try and thank him. I'd say, thank you so much for what you wrote. Thank you. Nephi, I don't think there was a day that went by that I didn't think about you. You helped me more. I just, I wanted to be like you. You were unstoppable. Nobody could stop you. And you wrote things about your family that were probably pretty hard to write, huh? I mean, today we might say, oh, he had a dysfunctional family. You know? <laughs> Hello, your brothers tie you up for four days. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't care. Nothing was going to stop Nephi from being with God again. He was so wonderful. Thank you, Nephi. 
Thank you for telling us about Lehi's dream and your interpretation of Lehi's dream. Boy, that, that helped me because so many times in my life I saw the great and spacious building laughing at me. Thank you, Nephi. Wouldn't it be fun to talk to him? That'd be great. Just to look eye to eye and think, you're him. You're him. You're, you're Nephi. Now, I think you ought to figure out what you're going to say first because if you don't, you might say something dumb. And I know this because I met Elder Maxwell once and I hadn't planned it out. It was after a, one of those big 18 stake firesides they have at the Marriott Center at BYU. And he was down there. Yeah, 18 stakes is that like all these people. My friends in Arkansas could have seen that. But uh, all these people. And uh, me and my friend Kurt were up in the stands just talking after the fireside and talking about what he had said. And we noticed that the line was really short. And I was like, Kurt, let's go down and say hi. Ooh, okay. So we ran down there to say hi. We were the last ones in line. And when I got there, Elder Maxwell put out his hand. And I, I shook his hand. And he put his other hand over the top of my hand. So gracious. And he said this, quote, thank you for waiting to come and talk to me. And here's dumb John, you know. You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, I mean, thank you. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe I ought to plan it out when you meet Nephi. Won't that be fun? So there is um, Melissa and Cammie with Nephi. And maybe Nephi will say, Cammie, Melissa, would you like to meet my, my brother, my little brother Jacob? And Melissa says, oh, yes. <laughs> Melissa loves Jacob. I'll tell you why she does in a minute. So Nephi says, well, I'll, I'll get him. So Nephi goes to get Jacob. Now, I got a letter from a young lady once. This is why I love Jacob. This young lady wrote me, and she said this. Dear brother, by the way, I don't need a spiritual overhaul. She said, I love seminary. I love my parents. I keep the word of wisdom, the law of chastity. I love the church. And then this very honest, wonderful line, bless her heart. She said, but sometimes it's just hard. And I thought, she, she's right. She's so honest. It's so nice. She's right. Have you ever felt like you come to meetings and it's like everyone, everybody's talking to you like you're just right on the edge of inactivity or breaking the law of chastity or something and you're just going, I can't even get a date. Talk to me. You know? Why don't you ever talk to me? I want to be good. I want to be valiant. Talk to me. Well, would you like to know who talks to you? Jacob talks to you right on. He does. In fact, let's open it up. Jacob chapter 3, verses um, 1 through 3. In fact, Jacob, while you're turning to that, it's on page 122 in your Book of Mormon. Jacob in chapter 2, what does he say over and over again? It's so interesting. He's like, I'm really sorry I have to say these things. I mean, it's going to wound your feelings. Some of your feelings are very tender and chaste. And I'm really sorry I have to do this before. <laughs> I'm going to have to do this. And then finally he gets to it in chapter 3. And guess how many verses you get, those of you who are sitting here saying, I don't need a spiritual overhaul. I'm trying to be good, but it's, it's hard. Guess how many verses you get, you pure in heart? You get two out of 14. Two of the most comforting verses, my favorite in, in all the scriptures, at least for now, because I'm still learning. But listen to what he says, Jacob 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold, I, Jacob, would speak unto you that are pure in heart. Or in other words, that say, I want to be valiant. Okay, I added that. Look unto God with firmness of mind. Pray unto him with exceeding faith, and he will console you in your afflictions. And he will plead your cause. And you'll love this. And he will send down justice upon those who seek your destruction. One more verse is all you get. Oh, all ye that are pure in heart, lift up your heads and receive the pleasing word of God and feast upon his love. For ye may, if your minds are firm forever. I love that. Now, how many times have you fallen asleep in a class? What's the answer? And you go, um, pray and read your scriptures. <laughs> what did Jacob just say? He said, didn't he? Pray. Lift up your heads. Look unto God with firmness of mind, praying to him with exceeding faith. And then he said, receive the pleasing word of God. Somebody once said, if you want to talk to God, pray. If you want God to talk to you, read your scriptures. And there it is, Jacob saying, hey, Cammy, Melissa, you're all right. Man, you're doing great. You're okay. Lift up your heads. Receive the pleasing word of God. Pray unto him with exceeding faith. Feast upon his love, for you may, if your minds are firm forever. Here comes Jacob, and here's Melissa. Thank you, Jacob, for those verses. Those helped me so much all through my life. Thank you, Jacob, for writing those. That part about the olive tree <laughs> was over my head. But thank you for this part, you know. <laughs> yeah, 77 verses of the allegory of olive tree. Remember that? Actually, Zenos wrote it. Okay, so there's Jacob. And maybe Jacob will say, Cammy, Melissa, would you like to meet Abinadi? Yes. Now, I know you have heroes in sports or music or whatever. But what are you going to think when the man 
Abinadi comes walking into the room. What are you going to think about courage when Abinadi comes walking in? Who knows he's going to be killed? I know you're going to kill me, but I'm going to deliver my message. And you won't be able to kill me until then. And they tried, right? And they fall down. Abinadi gave it to him. What are you going to think? I cannot wait to meet Abinadi. I have read Mosiah chapter 17 as carefully as I know how, and I have a question for Abinadi. Abinadi, can't wait. Did you know that Alma escaped? Were you there when Alma defended you before the king and said, let him go in peace? Remember? I mean, you've seen the painting, right? Here's Abinadi with the chains around his wrists. And over here, here's the king, and he's got leopards on each side. And uh, <laughs> then there's, there's the, the judges, and they're going... You know, they have beards and they're listening. Now listen, you've seen the paintings and they're old. they look old. They've got gray hair. But what does it say in Mosiah 17 too? And there was one among them whose name was Alma, he being descendant of Nephi. And he was a young man. Okay, but anyway, let's go back to Abinadi. So here's Abinadi and he gives his message and Alma, the elder, says to King Noah, um, he's, I think he's right. He's spoken the truth about our iniquities. I think we should let him go in peace. I wonder if Abinadi was standing there going, one of them heard me. Like, one of them heard me. But what happened? Alma's defense wasn't very successful, and pretty soon he escaped. He took off. And then the king said, sent his servants to slay him. He said, go get him, kill him. What do you think of Abinadi? The only one that I got to, and they're going to kill him. I wonder, I can't wait to ask Abinadi, did you see him? Did you know? Did you pray for him? Oh, Lord, bless that young man. He's the only one that heard me. You want to make the scriptures come to life? Use your head. It's all in there. And he did. He escaped, and he hid himself, and he wrote down everything that Abinadi had said. They sent Abinadi back to jail, and they killed him a couple of days later. And the last thing he said was, Oh, God, receive my soul. You think Abinadi was happy? No, but there's something better than happiness. You know what that is? Peace. Peace is the greatest. Peace means if I die tonight, I've repented. I've done what God wanted me to do. And if I die tonight, I'll be able to see Jesus. I won't be ashamed to look at him. And the queen, bless her heart, one of the wonderful women of the Book of Mormon, King Lamoni's wife, comes in and says, Ammon, um, my husband's been out for a couple of days now, as you know. And uh, is he going to wake up again? Because, I'll quote, some say that he is dead and that he stinketh, but to me he doth not stink. <laughs> it's in the book. I'm quoting scripture. <laughs> to me he doth not... Wives are so kind about odors and things, you know. <laughs> but to me he doth not stink. And Ammon says, he's going to wake up tomorrow morning. And then he says to this wonderful woman, paraphrasing, do you believe me? And she says, yeah. And he says, ah, woman, I say unto thee, I have not seen this great faith among the Nephites. A wonderful woman of the Book of Mormon. Well, guess what happens the next morning? King Lamoni wakes up, and he immediately get, begins to praise the Lord. The, king's, the queen is excited that he woke up, and so she starts to praise the Lord, and soon both of them, boom, boom, pass out. <laughs> and Ammon's so excited about this whole event and just being a missionary that he kneels down and starts to thank the Lord, and he passes out. Boom. <laughs> Enter another wonderful woman of the Book of Mormon that you'll get to meet someday. We know her name. It's Abish. And Abish comes walking in, and she's a convert, quote, on account of a remarkable vision of her father. And she walks in, and she sees all this, and she knows what's going on. And so she runs to, to tell the neighborhood, you know, come and see, come and see what happened. And they all come to run and see what happened, and they think that something evil has happened. In fact, one of, them, one of them's uh, brother was killed by Ammon. He gets out his sword, and he's about to strike Ammon, who's asleep, and bam, he, he's dead. <laughs> like, don't hit my prophets. He's out. Okay? And then the other ones are even backing off going, oh boy, I don't know what's going on here. This is evil. And Abish, bless her heart, this wonderful woman, is crying, thinking this is not what I wanted to happen. And then she thinks to herself, have you read this? It's so good. Maybe if I touch, not Ammon, not the king, maybe if I touch the queen, she'll wake up. So she goes over to the queen and touches her hand. And the queen wakes up. And she begins to praise the Lord, and she grabs the king, and he wakes up, and he begins to praise the Lord. And Ammon begins, it's just a happy day going on here. What a wonderful story. And then what happens? Ammon learns by the Spirit that Aaron is in jail, and he says to the king, um, can we go get my brother out of jail? 
He says, yeah, the king over that country uh, is a friend unto me. His name is Antiomno, so we can go get him out of jail. So they go, and on the way, they meet King Lamoni's father, who's the king over all of the land, and they have an interesting encounter, and I'll let you read about that. I want to get to the bottom line. The bottom line is they get to Aaron, and Aaron gets out of jail, and then Aaron stands before the king, and listen to what he says. So interesting. This is Alma 22, 3. If you will spare our lives, okay, remember Ammon 17.25, Alma 17.25, Ammon, I will be thy servant, Aaron now, sadder but wiser, well, <laughs> Alma 22.3, if you will spare our lives, we will be thy servants. Different approach. Now, I didn't learn this on my own. Somebody pointed out, Brother Scott Simmons pointed this out to me, and I've read about it since, but... <laughs> That is a hidden treasure in the Book of Mormon. That it's not pointed out. You just have to discover it. Isn't that fun? That if you go out as a missionary, have the attitude, I'm here to serve, not I'm here to preach. Now let's be fair to Aaron. It says that it was his lot to fall in with a group that were much harder hearted. So it's not entirely his fault. But that's the attitude to have. I'm here to serve. I want to help. That's what happened to Aaron. Okay. Let's see. Who can we meet next? So here's Cammy. Aaron, can I meet King Lamoni's father? Yeah, I'll get him. Why do, why do Cammie and I, why do we love King Lamoni's father? Because of his attitude. It is amazing. He had a change of heart like this fast. Because Aaron, remember Aaron said, if you won't kill us, we'll be thy servants. And he said, no, I don't want to kill you. I'm still kind of troubled about Ammon. He was so kind to my son. Can you tell me more about that? And so he does. And eventually, King Lamoni's father bows his head and says the most beautiful prayer to me. It's Alma 22:18. He says this. Now, you remember, please, would you? Talking about the TV thing. Would you give up your two worst TV shows to know God, or is that just too much? Listen to King Lamoni's father, Alma 22, 18. A prayer from a Lamanite investigator. Here it is. I memorized it for you, okay? Alma 22, 18. Oh, God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? Here it is. And I will give away all my sins to know thee except for my worst TV shows. You see, he didn't say that. He said, I will give them all away. Here's King Lamoni's father. Thank you so much. Your attitude was, I don't want my sins anymore. I want to be clean. I'll give them all away. Thank you, King Lamoni's father. And we'll learn his name, probably. <laughs> wow, so many fun people. Who, who should we meet next? Okay, this is where Cammie says to uh, Alma the Younger, um, do you know any of the 2,000 single men, I mean warriors? 2,000 warriors. Now, the younger says, I happen to know Helaman very well. Um, you want me to get him? Uh -huh. <laughs> so here comes Helaman, leader of the 2,000. Would that be fun? Alma 56, he's standing up in front of them, and he says, What say ye, my sons? Will ye go up against them to battle? He says, Oh, my beloved brother Moroni, I never have I seen so great courage. Nay, not amongst all the Nephites. Now, they had never fought. This is Alma 56, 47. Now, they had never fought but they did not fear death. They did think more upon their liberty of their fathers than they did upon their own lives. They had been taught by their, huh? Mothers? Yeah, that's what it says. Now, are you asking President Benson's question? Why did they put this in here? They had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. And they rehearsed unto me the words of their mothers saying, we do not doubt, our mothers knew it. Ammon, they don't even know he's a missionary yet. The king likes him. He says, well, listen, we've, we've been having some trouble with Lamanites scattering our sheep. Would you just help with this? So he gives him that job, and you know the whole story, right? I think it says three days. And he's out there watching the flocks, and all of a sudden, here they come. The, the king told him about the icky guys come to scatter the sheep. And they do. They scatter the sheep, and all the servants are like, oh, no, last time this happened, the king killed us. I mean, he killed our friends. And what? He killed our friends, not us. <laughs> And Ammon says, it's okay, it's okay, let's, let's get him. And, and they chase him, and they bring him all back. And then the icky guys come again. And this time, uh, the other guys. And Ammon's, Ammon's so cool, he says, I will show forth my power, comma, or the power that is in me. And then I will win their hearts. And then if I win their hearts, they'll listen to my words. So smart. So he gets out his sling, and the guys start coming at him. And how many does he hit with this sling? Six with the rocks, bum, 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 hit six of them. And they're getting kind of annoyed with this guy, so they start coming at him with clubs. 
And this, to me, is one of the great understatements of the Book of Mormon. It's Alma 17, 37. But behold, every man that lifted his club to smite Ammon, he smote off their arms with his sword. For he did withstand their blows by smiting their arms with the edge of his sword. Okay, here's the understatement of the year. And so much that they began to be astonished. <laughs> that is an understatement. Can you imagine? It's like, wah, yada, yada. <laughs> like, I'm beginning to be astonished. <laughs> he just cut my arm off. I just love that translation. They began to be astonished. I'm beginning to be astonished. Are you beginning? Yeah. I'm beginning to be astonished too. Let's be astonished together, you know? Isn't that great? Now, here's the fun thing, okay? I asked you a question earlier. Was Ammon using some kind of technique or did he really mean it? Because what happened? He does the thing with the arms and then he says, let's see, what was that other thing the king wanted me to do? Oh yeah, take care of the horses. See you guys. And he takes, he didn't say, now the king's gonna wanna talk to me. <laughs> he didn't. He says, let's see, I'm supposed to take care of the Yeah, see you guys later, bye. And he goes, and the other, the Lamanites are just, that was incredible. Let's go tell the king. He won't believe us. Yes, he will, pick up those arms. <laughs> <laughs> so they pick up the arms, they take them before the king, they drop them on the ground. I don't know what kind of noise that makes. <laughs> they drop them on the ground. <laughs> and if you thought, <laughs> if you thought the king was perplexed before, now the king is just, king's saying, great, great. Ammon is the great spirit. He's come to punish me because I killed some of the other ones who let the flocks get scattered. He's the great spirit, oh, great. And then he says to the servants, okay, here's where we find out. He says, where is he now? Um, he's taking care of your horses. The king says, wow, never have I had such a faithful servant. He, he remembers all my commands. Was he really telling the truth when he said, I'm here to serve? He sure was. That was no technique. It was the truth. I'm here to serve. The king says, I'd ask him to come here. A couple of my favorite words in the Book of Mormon. I'd ask him to come here, but I durst not. Isn't that fun? I durst not. <laughs> when you're confronted with peer pressure, you can say that. I durst not. <laughs> I like those words. Because I'd ask him to come here, but I durst not. I think he's really, really powerful. Well, finally, Ammon comes in. And he, he sees that the countenance of the king had changed. We're in Alma 18, 12. He, he sees that the countenance of the king had changed, and so he's about to leave. I mean, I imagine it's something like this. Okay, watch. What? <laughs> he sees the countenance of the king has changed, and he's about to leave. He's like, and then one of the servants, so cool, says, Rabbana, which being interpreted as a greater powerful king. Rabbana, the king desireth thee to stay. And Ammon says, what is it that I should do for thee, O king? And the king answered him not for the space of an hour. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, aren't you glad that's not on the video? <laughs> Just like. <laughs> well, we'll show Ammon for 10 minutes and then we'll show the king for 10 minutes and we'll do that three times, you know. Answered him not for the space of an hour, and Ammon reads his thoughts through inspiration and finally says, um, Are you wondering how I slew those who came to scatter your flocks? And I imagine the king. <laughs> <laughs> finally, the king has just had it. He's like, Who are you? Are you the great spirit? Ammon says, No, I'm a man. He says, Do you know about God? I don't know what that means. The king has never heard that word. I don't know what that means. He says, Do you know about the great spirit? Yeah, that's God. Are you sent from God? And Ammon says, I'm a man, but I'm called by his Holy Spirit to teach these things to the people. And that spirit gives me knowledge and also power. Oh, it's a great story. So he's got a captive audience now, and he teaches the king, and the king is converted, and what happens a lot in the Book of Mormon when people are converted? They tip over, they pass out. He's out. <laughs> he's caught up in the Spirit of the Lord or something, and he's out. I had been on a date the night before. I joke about it, but I have several. Did the, video, did the video that I pushed into the machine stain my hands? It's not that bad, Mom. It's not R. Did it stain my fingers so that I couldn't give a blessing or couldn't feel worthy? And some of you, maybe in this room, sat at this table today. And the teachers came up, teacher's quorum, and they put the cloth down, and then they put the bread and the water. And maybe the teachers were really thinking hard that day. 
and they put the bread and the water down and then they put a cloth over the top and maybe this wonderful 14, 15 year old was thinking, I wonder why we put a cloth over the top. And then maybe he thought this, oh, let's see, when they put Jesus' body in the tomb, they probably covered it up with a cloth. And then maybe the priest sat down, these wonderful young men with their clean hands, and they lifted up the cloth while they were singing the sacrament hymn, and they folded it back. And then they picked up those pieces of bread, and look at my hands, and they tore it in half. And maybe this wonderful 16, 17, 18-year-old priest was thinking, I wonder why we tear the bread in half. And maybe he started listening to the words of the hymn they were singing, Jesus of Nazareth, Savior and King, which says, bruised, broken, torn for us. Who's Jesus? Oh, he's the bread of life. That's right. And he put those pieces of bread down with his clean hands and the teachers and the deacons came and they picked that up and they walked it out and all of us reached out with our clean right hand and we put it inside of us. Can you see the symbolism? We put it inside. Just be part of us. And then they came back and these priests, they folded it back and then they lifted it up over the water and they knelt down and just as they had done with the bread, knelt down with this mouth, same one they've had all week in the locker room, same one behind the wheel of the car, knelt down and said the most repeated scripture in the church, one of them. Oh God, the eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this water. Can you see how important it is that we be clean? Why weren't you afraid of death, you 2,000 warriors? Because we were clean. If we die, then we will be with God. If we live, then God will be with us. I remember thinking about all this in my head, and then I thought, I'm okay. I can do this. And I closed my eyes and I said my very favorite words in the whole world. Never fail to feel something when I get to say these words. I said her name and then I said in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the holy Melchizedek priesthood which I hold, I lay my hands upon your head and seal the anointing which has taken place. And I proceeded to give my friend Jill a blessing. And then yes, I picked her up, carried her to her roommate's car and she drove her to the hospital. I went back to my room. It was only about 5.45 at this time. You think I went to sleep? Nope. I knelt down and I said what happens every time you give a blessing, if you're like me, it scares you to death. Heavenly Father, I did my best. I cleared my mind. I said the words that came into my head. I pray that thou will honor that blessing according to my faith and according to Jill's faith and Mike's faith. Please. Clean hands and a pure heart. There's a difference. This is so cool. I can't wait to tell you. Okay. Okay, here's Elder Oaks talking. Now, I think it's kind of fun that Elder Oaks uses a tree as an example, but this is how it goes, okay? <laughs> Elder Oaks gives an example about a tree, and here I'm going to explain the difference between clean hands and a pure heart. He that hath clean hands and pure heart. Okay, here we go. Elder Oaks, quote, a person who sins, look at my arm, a person who sins is like a tree that bends easily in the wind. On a windy and rainy day, the tree bent so deeply against the ground that the leaves became soiled with mud like sin. If we only focus on cleaning the leaves, clean hands, the weakness in the tree that allowed it to bend remains. Merely cleaning the leaves does not strengthen the tree. What's the point? Clean hands is being cleansed. Pure heart is the attitude, is the change of heart, is the I want to be valiant, is the losing desire for sin, is King Lamoni's father saying, I will give away all my sins to know thee. Why am I bringing this up right now? Because, can I pound this for a minute? Thanks for looking up. There is a problem. And that is, in the church, like Elder Acey said, too many have this, well, I'll sin now, and then I'll repent just before a mission. Now they believe their hands can be cleaned, but their heart is not changed, is it? Here's the whole sentence that this talk was made for. Are you ready? Here it is. A heart that asks, how bad can I be, is not pure. It's filthy. A heart that says, how far can I go before I have to see the bishop, is not a pure heart. It needs to be changed. Who can do that? Jesus. He's the only one. You ask for it, you plead for it, you do the best you can, and he does it for you. What happened to King Benjamin's people, remember, Mosiah 5.2? They said, our hearts are changed. We have no more desire to do evil, but to do good continually. Now, don't be too hard on yourself. That happened to Enos, that happened to Paul, that happened to King Lamoni, but it doesn't happen to everybody that way, okay? One more quote, okay? Stay with me. President Benson. Oh, thank you, President Benson, for saying this. Here he goes. 
We must be cautious as we discuss these remarkable examples. Though they are real and powerful, they are the exception more than the rule. For every Paul, for every Enos, for every King Lamoni, there are hundreds and thousands of people who find the process of repentance much more subtle, more imperceptible. Day by day, they move closer to the Lord, little realizing they are building a godlike life. They live quiet lives of goodness, service, and commitment. They are like the Lamanites, who the Lord said were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. Can you just see Moroni, Mormon, Alma, seeing our day and going, oh boy, family, motherhood, totally under attack. I'm going to put this story in there. I'm going to say the word mothers three times in two verses. I hope they notice it. Because sometimes the work of motherhood, as I've watched my own mother and my sisters with their kids, is repetitive. It's every day. It's service, 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 service. <laughs> And here's these 2,000 warriors and an equally powerful army of mothers that is responsible for them. At least equally powerful army of mothers every day in little ways. Uh-huh, that's where God is. He's in heaven. Uh-huh, that's the sacrament that we remember the body of Jesus when we take the bread. Yes, I'll help you with your prayers. Every single day, service, 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 service. And finally, these young men are like, yeah, we'll take them on. We would not fight them if they would leave us alone. See, we have been taught by our mothers that if we did not doubt, God would deliver us. I think that's one of the coolest things in the scriptures because they credit their moms. And you'll get to meet one of these warriors. But isn't it interesting, though, let's think about this for a minute. Isn't it interesting that the scripture says they had been taught by their mothers, okay? Think about what it might have said. They had been taught by their public school teachers. Don't we seem to be throwing everything their way? Well, apparently the families aren't teaching it, so let's have sex education in the schools. Let's have them distribute birth control at the schools. Let's blame it on teachers. And here's Elder Packer in the last general conference saying, the shield has to be made in the family. And here's these young men. Now, did it say they had been taught by their public school teachers? No. Did it say they had been taught by their fathers? No. It did not say. That is amazing to me. It says they had been taught by their mothers. And I wonder. They saw our day and thought, boy, I've got to put this in here. I, boy, I hope they read that. I hope they notice that. These moms. And I, standing here today, can say exactly the same thing. I credit my mother for everything wonderful. Because my dad was out bringing home the bacon, which he should have been. But I credit mom. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, everything I ever hoped to be, I owe to my angel mother. I owe it to my mom. This equally powerful army of mothers behind the 2,000 warriors. Now, this is one of the questions that I want to ask the warriors. You know, why? God, it says in verse 47 of Alma 56 that you had never fought, but that you didn't fear death. How come you didn't fear death? Let me explain with the story, can I? First of all, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is, they were clean. That's the answer. Here's the story. Phone rings, 5.30 in the morning. My roommate answers it. How do you answer the phone at 5.30, you know? Uh. <laughs> it's Lisa across the hall. Lisa says, Mike, my old roommate, Mike, this is Lisa, and Jill's been sick, and she's had migraines, and she's been thrown up all night, and you guys got to come over and give her a blessing, and then you got to pick her up and carry the car, because I can carry by myself, and you got to come over and do it right now. And uh, thanks, bye. <laughs> and Mike kind of goes, what? <laughs> and he comes over to my door. John, get up. What? John, get up. We've got to go give a blessing. John, get up. It's an emergency. We've got to go give a blessing. So we pull on some clothes and we run over there to give a blessing. Three flights of stairs. Go run into this back room. And there's Lisa. Bless her heart. Been up all night. And there's Jill. Sick in bed. She looked bad. I don't know what she usually looks like because she's a teller at the credit union. She looked bad. And, and she had been throwing up all night. And I won't tell you how I know that. Okay? But we came in. And uh, Mike had a little keychain thing that holds the oil and he got that out and he anointed her head and then it was my turn and my hands came out of my sleeves and I remembered a song that my dad used to play Jesse Evans Smith used to sing this song Psalms 24 3 and 4 I looked it up later it asks a question it says who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place footnote says that means temple and then it says this the answer verse 4 he that hath clean hands and very important and underline it a pure heart. And as I looked at my hands, I thought, are my hands clean? Can I do this? Do I have the priesthood today? Section 121, verse 37. That they may be conferred upon us, the rights of the priesthood. It is true. But when we undertake to cover our sins or gratify our pride, our vain ambition, 
or exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness. The heavens withdraw themselves. The spirit of the Lord is grieved. And when it is withdrawn, amen. Or in other words, sayonara to the priesthood and the authority of that man. I thought, do I have the priesthood? Thank you for letting me get through that part. That, I just love that. But there's a difference, my friends. Clean hands, pure heart. And the heart that wants to know how bad it can be before the mission or temple marriage is not pure. Clean hands, pure heart. Okay, here's the fun part. Why didn't you fear, you 2,000 warriors? Well, it's because something that Alma the Younger said. What did he say? Ooh, it's so scary. Alma the Younger gives us two choices when we get to heaven, when we're brought to stand before God to use his words. Here's choice one. Can ye look up at that day with, guess, a pure heart and clean hands? Or, Alma 12, 14, our words will condemn us, our works will condemn us, our thoughts will condemn us, and in this awful state, we will not dare to look up to our God. We would fain be glad if we could command the rocks and the mountains to fall upon us and hide us from his presence. Whew. That's the choice. Now, if you were to walk up to me on the street one day and say, Brother, by the way, what is your biggest goal in life? I would turn and say, and there's a million different ways to say this. This is the way Alma said it. I would say, I want to look up. When I am at that wonderful, amazing, terrible, powerful, great day, when I'm brought into the presence of Jesus, I want to be able to look up because I know I've tried my hardest and I've tried my hardest to repent. And that's what Alma's trying to do. If you were about to stand before God tonight, can you look up? Or would you want the mountains to cover you up because you're so concerned about being popular, about doing what everybody else is doing, that you can't look up because you're ashamed? Okay, well, okay, let's move on. That's the 2,000. How fun. And then maybe, uh, let's see, who else can we meet? How about Nephi the third? Do you know who that is? Nephi the third is the one in third Nephi. There are three Nephi's in the Book of Mormon. There's Nephi at the very beginning, and then there's Nephi, the, the, the index calls Nephi 2 and Nephi 3. Nephi 2 was a great missionary. Nephi 3 was, uh, he had a problem. Okay, let's imagine that this were going to happen, that this was going to happen. Uh, tomorrow morning, imagine if you got this announcement at your school or something. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start killing. We're going to start killing all the believers, and we're going to keep killing. And the killing will keep going until all of the believers are gone. We've had it with you people, with your stupid traditions. Samuel the Lamanite said that there would be a day, a night, and a day without any darkness. It hasn't happened, and tomorrow morning, we're going to start putting you to death. We've had it. Now, there's one guy, his name is Nephi 3. And this is 3 Nephi chapter 1, and he prays all day long. I want to meet him. All day long, he's praying. Can you imagine what he must have said in his prayer? Oh, um, things are getting a little urgent down here. Um, <laughs> We need the sign to be given um, tonight, or we're all dead. And we're willing to die, but we need the sign to be given tonight, or they're, they're going to kill us. And he prays all day and into the night, and what happens in verse 13, or close to sunset, I guess. Verse 13, a voice comes to him and says, do you remember? It says, lift up your head and be of good cheer. Who is it? It's Jesus. Listen to what he says. Lift up your head and be of good cheer, for on this night will the sign be given. And on the morrow come I into the world. What night was it? It was Christmas Eve. Yeah, it was April, but it was Christmas Eve. Isn't that neat? Will you ever think of Christmas Eve the same way? I hope you won't. Christmas Eve, and he came. Those wonderful words, be of good cheer, lift up your head. I'm coming tonight. And Nephi, can you imagine? Thank you. Thank you. Or I thank thee. Then what happens? Sun goes down, and it doesn't get dark. <laughs> And it keeps going, time keeps going, but it doesn't get any darker. And then my favorite thing happens. The people who were getting ready to kill everybody the next day became exceedingly astonished. <laughs> in so much that they fell over as if they were dead. <clears throat> They're out. Exceedingly astonished. And the sun goes down and it doesn't get darker and the sun comes up the next day. A day and a night and a day, just like Samuel the Lamanite said. And that's in 3 Nephi chapter 1 and in 3 Nephi chapter 11, Jesus comes, doesn't he? And there's one person that he calls out of the multitude and says, asks him to come up. Who is it? It's Nephi the third. And Nephi the third comes up and Jesus touches him and gives him power to bless and to baptize and things. Let's be careful. Let's repent. 
Let's read our Book of Mormon. Let's never again go out and say, well, how bad can I be? Or how good are we supposed to be? <laughs> Let's go out there, stripling warriors that we are, and say, I want to be valiant. That's what President Benson said in my other quotage here. Why do you think the story of the 2000 is in there? Because, listen to President Benson. It is not by chance that you have been reserved to come to earth in this last dispensation of the fullness of times. Your birth at this particular time was foreordained in the eternities. You are to be the royal army of the Lord in the last days. You are the youth of the noble birthright. In the spiritual battles you are waging, I see you as today's sons of Helaman. You mean we're supposed to listen to our mothers? <laughs> yeah. That's why the story's in there, because that's you. Then when we get to heaven, we can, like Enos 127, see his face, what? With pleasure. Because we've repented, because we're clean. Well, I think I'm done. One more thing. Some of you, but brother, by the lake, I'm only 15. I'm not supposed to be perfect. Listen to what, this motivates me so much. Listen to what Mormon said. Mormon 115. Here we go. Page 470, and I being 15 years of age, this is Mormon talking, and I being 15 years of age and being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. Can you do that at 15? I think you can. It means we have to start giving away all of our favorite sins and saying I'll give them all away to know God. It means we gotta be valiant, we gotta stand a little taller. We gotta be, what did President Hunter say in May 94 or April 94 conference? We must know Christ more than we know him. We must remember him more often than we remember him. We must serve him more valiantly than we serve him. What manner of men and women ought we to be even as he is? Why is it important to be valiant? Because section 76 verse 79 says, describing those who will go to the terrestrial kingdom, these are they who are not, what? Valiant in the testimony of Jesus. We gotta do it. Now, one more thing. I love Nephi because he was so positive, okay? 2 Nephi 33, 12. He says this, at the end of his words, and I pray that many of us, and then he stops. I pray that many of us, if not all, might one day be saved in his kingdom. Sometimes people, if only one life will be changed, it will be worth it. And I just want to go, oh, my measly goal. <laughs> Gee, if there's three, four hundred people here, Maybe if we have one of these every 400 years, or once for 400 years, maybe every life will be changed. <laughs> oh, good goal. And here's Nephi. I pray that many of us, if not all, it's too, we can't do that. We need every heart to be changed. We gotta walk out of here today and say, I wanna be valiant. We gotta get on our knees tonight and say, Father, apply the atonement of Jesus to my heart and change my heart so that I have no more desire to sin. But I just wanna be valiant. That's what I do every time. I want to be changed. So I just have no desire to sin. My friends, I'm going to heaven, and I'm taking my wife with me, whoever she is. <laughs> I can't get there without her, and she can't get there without me, as a matter of fact. Well, she can't get there without her husband. I hope it's me, but we're going back. Let's all be there. Let's go back. I want to see that face. I want to see those hands. I'm going to heaven. My talk was about the Book of Mormon. You use your imagination, you can bring it to life. And all those people, they were real people. They lived. Nephi was real. We get to meet him. And all that's just waiting for you at home in your scriptures. You can read about these wonderful people and meet him. I bear my testimony that God is real, that Jesus is real. This is the true church. You're in the right place. Isn't it wonderful to know you're in the right place? Joseph Smith was a prophet. He saw the Father and the Son. He saw Angel Moroni. We'll see him too one day. And the Book of Mormon is true. I hope we can learn to be wiser than they have been, and that's why they gave us their book. And I say this, my brothers and sisters and my friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. really perceptive teenager once asked me this question. Brother, by the way, if Jesus is resurrected, how come there's still wounds in his hands? How come? How come he's not all perfect again where they put the nails through his hands? You don't know the answer? I think it's to fulfill prophecy. Get your Old Testament out. Zechariah 13, 6. The Jews are still waiting for Jesus to come the first time, or for the Messiah to come, I should say, the first time. We're waiting for the second coming, okay? And when he comes, they're going to look at his hands, and Zechariah 13, 6 says... 
what are those wounds in your hands? And he will answer them and say, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now, if you want a better um, version of that whole thing, get your Doctrine and Covenants out. Look in section 45, verses 51 and 52. What are those wounds in your hands and in your feet? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Then he tells them, I am Jesus Christ. I am he who was lifted up. I am the Son of God. And they'll know. Does Jesus remember you? Every time he looks at his hands. First Nephi 21, verses 15 and 16. Yea, they may forget, but I will not forget thee, O house of Israel. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. What a great, powerful scripture. Now, what do you think is going to surprise you the most when you get to heaven? Cammy and Melissa, will it be your new body? It's glowing. <laughs> no. Will it be your parents? I mean, you young men out there, you think your dad's going to be resurrected at the same age that he died? No, there won't be any age. I heard it said that we'll be resurrected in our prime. We'll look 19, 20. And you walk up to your dad, and your dad will say, Hi, son, you want to race? That'd be fun. There's a little poem somebody wrote. It goes like this. When you get to heaven, you will likely view many folks whose presence there will be a shock to you. But keep it very quiet. Do not even stare. Likely there'll be many folks surprised to see you there. <laughs> so what do you think is going to surprise you the most? <laughs> will it be when you see Nephi and when you meet all these wonderful people? Well, we happen to have prophets in this church. And a prophet told us, this is the most favorite thing I've ever heard anybody say in or out of the church anytime ever, period. I don't know how anybody could take this quote off number one in my chart anyway. Here it is. You want to hear it? This is President Ezra Taft Benson. If you want to look this up, get your uh, May 91 conference issue, and it's quoted in Henry Eyring's talk, Elder Eyring. It may have been Bishop Eyring at the time. Here it is. Ready? Quote, nothing is going to startle us more when we pass through the veil to the other side, than to realize how well we know our Father and how familiar His face is to us. And some of you sitting here actually walked in with the thought on your mind, I don't feel very close to God. And here's President Benson saying, nothing is going to startle us more than how well we know Heavenly Father, how familiar His face is to us. And tonight you get to go home and kneel down and pray to that father that you know so well it's going to startle you. And some of you really bright teenagers out there are thinking, how does he know that? Good question. How does President Benson know that that face will startle us, that we know it so well? Maybe he's a prophet. <laughs> maybe President Gordon B. Hinckley is a prophet. There's no maybes. He's a prophet. You are in the right church. You're in the right place. And you might have questions. And some of you might have doubts. I'm out of doubts. I don't have any doubts anymore. I have a ton of questions. No doubts. It's true. I love it so much. It's absolutely true.